This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 096. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Jonathan, I know where I'm, I'm giving some stuff away here, but we just wrapped a three recording day. I don't think we've, we've never done three in a row like this. You know what? Feels pretty good. We're on the three of three and uh, we still got energy. We still got it. And all three awesome conversations this afternoon and this morning. Yeah, it is funny how, I mean, totally different topics, different areas. Um, and so obviously this one, we just chatted with Isaiah and that's going to be coming out kind of state of the union of all things, you know, what's going on in the world right now, coming off of Father's Day weekend. I was going to ask you about that. What did you guys get up to? Oh, we had a good one. I'm going to get in trouble here. We had ABVMA leadership weekend this weekend, feeling a little bit under the weather. Sunday morning was conference uh, in the continuing education, which I did not make. Going back to my, you know, some university days, ended up hanging out with my kids. We got on out for a two hour longest bike we've done in the city yet. And then in the afternoon, which was pretty cool, post COVID uh, ish, I uh, got together with some friends that we haven't seen for a while. We went to an Oktoks dogs game. So this is a town that's south of us, baseball game. Uh, I couldn't even tell you what league they play in, but really enjoyed the time having everybody together, kids playing and running around the grass. It was a lot of fun. Candace then spoiled us with a dinner and uh, got to bed early to hopefully feel better today. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Went I, all around. I love how much sort of, you know, random stuff you do. Like you, like, you know, sports teams, you don't even know what league they're in. You don't know anyone playing. You, you and the family will just go check it out. I didn't even know what color they were. Classic. Seattle Seahawks. I remember that the first time in 2013, you were such a fan. I'm like, which team is which? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that is classic job. Uh, but no, it was good. It was a lot of fun. It was Jack's first time at a baseball game there. Candace and I, first time that we'd gone there, even though we'd driven by that facility and the stadium is beautiful. Um, first time we've done that and we've been by there dozens of times. So it was really cool. Yeah. So that's my father's day. What about you? What'd you get up to? Nice. Uh, we went out to the lake, so took Riley out there, went for some boat rides, got her swimming in the lake. So it's fun. Like, I mean, for her, everything is still new, right? So it's, I guess we had her there last year, but th- she just was so young, like she really didn't do much. Now she's playing in the sand and swimming. So it's, it's pretty nice. fun, like re-experiencing things through a child's eyes. Sure is, because you basically get to become a child again, and they want you to be that. They want you right down at their level, doing things with them. So enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. No, so that's good. Pivoting over a little bit then to the, to the conversation we're about to have with Isaiah. It is so strange. Like here, you and I are just bantering and what's going on over the weekend. And it's all, you know, very positive, very light. And then we're about to go into this conversation with Isaiah and like, it can get pretty heavy, you know, like there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. So much uncertainty. I mean, the, the Russia, Ukraine invasion, you know, very heavy topic, inflation, people are st- like struggling to afford things like uh, Rosalie and Riley, they, they made pizza for Father's Day, Riley likes to make it. And Rosalie had this like little thing of ham, like shaved ham. And she's like, this was $17. Like it was, it's insane, the price of where things are going. So I don't know, yeah. I guess I just wanted to see your perspective you're, you're such a positive person. Are you starting to feel some of this economic events in the world? Yeah, I feel it as a measure and, and it's so good that you bring it up it, and it's a measure of empathy and, and trying to understand the bigger context then to where I can help support the teams. And that sounds flu flu and, and over the top, but it's real. I think 
you know, and, and this is part of our podcast today is educating a person that does not spend time in the financial markets trying to understand it, doesn't listen to CNBC, doesn't trade or, or you know, have personal investments, maybe because they don't have the knowledge, experience, and or the desire to learn about that. Well, you and me, this is what we banter with when we're not recording or, you know, catching up on the world. And for me, um, it's ensuring that I am doing what I need to, to make sure that my team is supported, knowing that some of my team are in, in, in sometimes rough spots, whether it's financially, personally, you know, friends and family. Uh, and then for us personally, just making sure that our plan is still moving forward the way that we think. And you asked me this pre-recording, are you doing anything about it? I'm going... I already made my choices and I've made my choices a while back as to what we we're going to go forward with in business in the veterinary world. And yeah, I've got some room to flex and such, but I need to make sure that I'm looking after my own and family and team to whatever happens in the next six months, let alone the next three to five years. That's where I need to focus my time on. That's my view. Yeah. And do I sleep at night or not sleep at night because of this right now? No, but again, um, we're in an absolutely fortunate position. Mm -hmm. And it is, I mean, the veterinary industry in general, and Isaiah kind of alludes to that as, I don't know, I don't know if we can say re recession proof, but definitely resilient, you know, like we're, we're fortunate in the, in that sense that, you know, we're, we're still, people are demanding our services very heavily. Right. So we yeah. can, you can still, with all those skills that you've acquired, go and deliver a service, you know, and, and get paid for that. So, you know, that's right. always reassuring to, to be able to have that. It is. And yet in the same fashion, we need to ensure that we are keeping our businesses as efficient as possible. So that continues and really making sure that we focus on those little things. And I think that's where we're getting into if, and out of anything is the easy money, so to say. And it's never easy. And I don't mean that to be um, egotistical or anything else. We need to really dive down into our businesses now to understand where we can better be efficient in our business to ensure that we can protect our teams, the clients and everything else. And I think that is going to get the details are coming in terms of acknowledging that and uh, low interest rates, low inflation is in the past here for the next little while, at least. Yeah, definitely seems that right way. And I think Isaiah mentioned even picturing, you know, maybe your household as a business, what you can control is your savings rate. So, That's you know, in, in 2021, where things were a little more flush, uh, you know, maybe some expenses just sort of slipped through the cracks. And now it's kind of time to look at those and, and tighten things up. Absolutely. Like even Candace and I actually, and we enjoy the process of it. So we might be weird that way, but in the last few weeks, we're like, all right, we're going to hold off some expenses and and it's enjoying to see what you actually need versus want and, uh, and rolling with it. And again, we, we find that an enjoyable process of going, yeah, maybe I don't need that second thing or that third thing. Cause I love this first thing so much, mm -hmm. but when it's easy, you go to that second and third. And so, yeah, we're, we'll continue to go down that now. But I, and I know you're leading this conversation, but our conversation with Isaiah, right? opinion only. This is for entertainment value. We are not offering financial advice as we do with any of our podcasts. Please go seek professional opinion and or advice at any time. Correct, Mike? Absolutely. Absolutely. So this doesn't change for anything today if we're talking all things inflation, interest, Bitcoin, and otherwise, which we did get into again today. Uh, you you lit up. I, I could tell when we were setting this up, you're like, oh, I just can't wait to ask Isaiah more like Bitcoin stuff. And I was really chocolate at that but well number two with isaiah i'm, I'm interested to see how the continuance of our uh, of our relationship goes because i really respect his views uh and he is a lot more knowledgeable than i am so i consider myself a retail investor compared to him as an institutional investor when it comes to crypto yeah he's a sharp guy so i guess with that i mean you you've heard him on the show before isaiah douglas is a certified financial planner certified exit planner and fee only advisor. He left a large national firm to found a solo financial planning firm in 2018 to pursue a planning approach that is dedicated to identifying ways to grow the net worth of veterinarians. In the summer of 2020, Isaiah merged with another financial advisor and became a partner in Vincier Wealth Management. Isaiah is the host of the weekly podcast, The Veterinary Success Podcast, which interviews and discusses topics related to the clinical, business, financial, and per personal lives of veterinarians. 
He is deeply involved in speaking within the veterinary within veterinary medicine via students, podcasts, video interviews, and the Veterinary Financial Summit Conference. Again, this is all sort of opinion only. Obviously, Isaiah has a wealth of information. I'm kind of a nerd on this subject too. I, 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 he, he said, reach out anytime. And, and Isaiah, you may regret that because I'll be contacting you all the time to discuss this. This is a fascinating time to be alive just with what is going on, interest rates, inflation, world economy. So you're going to enjoy this. It will be very interesting, you know, maybe six months from now, checking back in and seeing how things have played out. But anywho, enjoy this conversation with Isaiah Douglas. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We have Isaiah Douglas with us again. We, we messaged him quickly here over the weekend. And I don't know if anyone else has been noticing all the headlines going on. And we said, Isaiah, we need to get you on. We need to do kind of an emergency state of the union. So here we are. Break it down for us. What the hell is going on in the economic world right now? Um, that's such a, an easy question to ask and a hard one to answer, right? Like, <laughs> let's just dive right in. Um, so if you think about like, just to lay the framework, so you have inflation at a 40 year high, which is, which is hard. And I think, um, there, there's some people out there that think inflation is good. I would argue it's not. And I think it's played out that inflation maybe is not necessarily great. If you own all the things that you ever want to own, inflation can be nice. If you have all the the assets you want to own, if you have the house that you want forever and all those things, if that's the case, then you, maybe you're good. But if you want to acquire anything, inflation has been difficult. Um, and also the other thing that has happened is you're seeing in, uh, interest rates start to rise as well. So those two things in tandem is, is really tricky. And that's been really detrimental to the idea of what historically has kind of driven a lot of investment framework, which is this idea of 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds, right? And so all of a sudden people are seeing statements and starting to think about, well, I thought my safe money was bonds and the bonds haven't done what they're supposed to do, yeah. supposed to with my air quotes, like, no, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do because they're, they're um, contracts, right? So the, the idea of what's going on in the world, it's really driven by interest rates and inflation. Like if you want to break everything down, those are the two things that drive everything. And there's a really, um, there's people far smarter than myself that will talk about, you know, the bond market dictates so much of what happens in the stock market. And that's where the smart money is because they have to be a lot more skeptical where people in the stock market, they can always say, oh, you know, everything grows to the sky where with bonds, it's like best case scenario. Uh, I give someone my money, I earn my interest rate and then I get my money back. That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is you lose everything, right? So the people in the bond market are going to be a little bit more um, skeptical and, and dig a little bit deeper. And I think at the moment, those are the two biggest things that are driving what's going on. And that impacts housing, that impacts, you know, practice valuations, that impacts your 401k or any other retirement savings. Like there's all these ramifications that kind of go from that. Yeah. All, I, I'm going to jump in here, if I may, Mike, for two seconds. Yeah, give it. 2020, just... 2021, COVID, easy money, printing of money government giving money away, literally giving money away with no expectation of return has led into an area where for a generation uh, 50 and under perhaps has never seen inflation like this. My parents all had inflation rate or all had interest rates in the range of 16, 18% back in the early 80s. But for anybody that's graduated vet school or veterinary profession in the last 20 years, this is brand new. How are you having discussions with your clients or others to the expectation and or the education of what we're going through right now? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's very true because it's all relative. Like your parents will say, well, my mortgage was, well, you could get a CD that was 9% too. And like, show me where those are right now, right? And also your home prices weren't. So the average US home price, I know in Canada, it's even worse. The US average US home price is $470,000. Um, yeah. And if you look at the... Um, Oh, there's a really good stat that I have to read because if I don't read it, it's going to be a miss on this. So uh, January, 2021, 30-year mortgage, 2.65 um, today. It's just north of right around 6%. That's a 106% increase in the average monthly mortgage payment, um, assuming a 20% down payment. So the idea of housing affordability um, is insane at the moment. Like it is absolutely, and I just released a a podcast recently. Um, it was actually earlier this morning on the, the housing market is absolutely the, the bubble is starting to burst. So if it's not bursting and burst, it is in the process of getting pricked by that pen. Like when you see this environment, 
you are going to either see home prices have to correct and correct strong because the rate, the mortgage payment, no one is going to be able to afford that. And then the other challenge with that is starting to see outside, you know, hedge fund and investment managers starting to buy homes all over. And in my county in Indiana, which is not the hotbed for outside money, um, there's two 70 plus brand new builds where hedge funds came in and bought every single house and paid every single amount of extra on labor and materials. They just signed off and said, we'll pay whatever it is. That makes housing unaffordable. But to answer your question, as far as going back to the question, because I just got off on a tangent, because I was like, this is such an interesting stat. Um, there's four market environments you can be in. Rising inflation or slowing inflation. I feel pretty confident we're in rising inflation. And then it is, is the economy growing or is it slowing? So the idea of stagflation, and some people might have heard that term, right? So last time we saw that, late 70s, early 80s. That's gas lines, that's shortages. People are not making as much and feel poorer each day. Even if you made good money, all of a sudden it, things aren't there as much, slowing economy and things getting more expensive. The awesome thing about veterinary medicine is it's going to be less impacted than most industries. And that's what I've tried to stress to, to clients. It's like, you're still in a, an amazing industry that your income can still grow. And that's why I've also been a proponent of the idea of production over salary. I know some people hate the idea of production, uh, salary, it's fixed and you have to go ask for a raise when I have production or I'm at least on pro sale, my income is going to at least step up when they raise prices in the practice. And I think that's super important that a lot of people don't get and maybe don't grasp, but you should be, if I'm younger or I'm negotiating something, I want pro sale or production in a world of higher inflation. So I think that's really important. So we've talked about from a compensation perspective, how to have those conversations. Um, but there's really only four, four market environments, right? It's either growing economy, slowing economy, and the economy is slowing. So GDP, again, I'm in the States, but uh, I would assume in Canada it's similar. I haven't, I didn't check before I jumped on here, but I would say, hey, first quarter GDP, so gross domestic product, which is what we make, was less than what it was prior. You have two quarters. That is a recession. Four is a depression. We will absolutely be in a recession, but it won't know until Q3 of 2022. We are in a recession right now, in my opinion, without a doubt. And so- well, how do, you, how do you navigate that um, in a world of higher inflation and slowing growth? Commodities. So commodities have been interesting. And, you know, at Canada, Canada's, you know, natural resource rich. And, you know, there, there's a lot of gold bugs up there. And I think that's an interesting idea of saying, hey, how can I protect and preserve purchasing power? And that's, that's one idea. But just commodities in general, if you look at owning raw commodities over the last 10 years, it's still been a losing trade. Even though if you look year to date over you know, a little over six months, it's up 30, 35%, just a broad ETF. So an exchange traded fund, nothing special. And then you can look at um, other things that do poorly in a rising interest rate, rising inflation environment, bonds do terrible. So um, for us, that is something that we have a lot of younger clients that aren't you know, bond heavy anyways, but for a lot of folks that are getting closer to retirement, they're safe money that they've been told from their financial advisor for years and years and years is put it in bonds. And it's like, that's not safe. Bonds are not safe. Tell why it's not safe. So, I mean, if you look at, so if we go back to the great financial crisis, right? It was the consumer was way over leveraged. So that means they had too much borrowed money. Consumers in better shape, although I'm starting to see like the credit card debt is starting to ramp up because inflation. So a lot of people are starting to just charge stuff and hope that it's going to change, which it will not. Um, but businesses have been able to borrow at cheap, cheap, cheap rates. So they have tons of debt and the governments have tons of debt as well. So you have bonds that are typically corporate. So that's going to be, you know, you're borrowing and you're saying, Hey, IBM, I'm going to give you money for X amount of years. And you're going to pay me a certain amount. Most people are buying it through some sort of fund. They're not buying individual bonds. So, you know, there's some bond manager out there that's managing this, but if you see rising interest rates, the aggregate bond index in the United States, if there's a 1% increase in rates, that's a negative five to like five and a half percent return, which is over two years of income that it's going to pay. And so that is an easy way to, um, lose a lot of purchasing power. And there's a, an analyst, her name's Lynn Alden, who's fantastic. And so she did some research and she has some really deep research, very long um, writings. And it was all about, she looks at where we're at being kind of post World War II. So kind of 1940s, 1950s, kind of thinking of COVID as like a war, right? Lots of spending, lots of things, but you're not seeing the ramp up in the economy. Like when you know the soldiers came home, right? It's a little bit of a different scenario. But what happened is you could put $10,000 into a US treasury bond and your $10,000 paid out with the um, coupon payment over that 10 years, you got back your $12,000 in total, right? You got your coupon payments, you got your $10,000 back, but the purchasing power of that money turned into be about $6,700 at the end of 10 years. So it was a losing amount. I think that's the idea of the failing fast or failing slow. Yeah. Failing slow seems to be very, very convenient for a lot of people because they can look at their account and say, I still have $20,000. I still have $10,000. But it's like, yeah, but you know what? Chicken last year was up 20%. 
Do you eat protein? Beef, same thing. Your house, housing prices are up 32% this year, year over year. Last year, we're up 20%. Your house has doubled, more than doubled over the last 10 years. And so it's like, you're never going to be able to save your way to the goals and things that you want to do. And it is hard and you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, because you put your money to work. And then all of a sudden the market goes down and you're like, well, shit, now I have less money, Isaiah. This isn't good either. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a combination of things. And it's like, I, that we're, in a, we're in a spot right now where you just want to be resilient. You got to stay afloat, get through it. You're not trying to hit a home run right now. And in my, in my opinion, it's like, you got to just, you got to maintain and just try to, to make it through. It, there's going to be certain opportunities that have done really well, but you have to think differently than what has worked the last 12 years where it's been easy money. And it's been U.S. stocks, U.S. bonds, U.S. real estate. That does not work. And I think, you know, Michael, I would love to get your opinion on from a real estate investor, this 40 year trend of falling interest rates, this burst strategy of buying an asset that's going up in value because of inflation and falling interest rates where I can refinance and pull out and pull out this money. All of a sudden, some of those games don't work in, a, in an environment where interest rates go up. So I would love I mean, if you want to, or if you haven't recorded one, I think you should talk about how a real estate investor navigates that, because I think there's a lot of people that think they're more talented than they are in the real estate game that are going to get bitten very, very hard with some variable rates. And all of a sudden they're going to be like, well, shoot, I'm poor now. I don't, I can't afford this. And there's going to be some forced sellers out there. So that's interesting to me. Well, and that's a fascinating, in the circles I'm in, we've been chatting on this so much and so many people think they've, they've worked miracles. And it's, it's like, no, it was the macro environment behind the scenes, this huge churning, like you said, of the lowering interest rates. And then the other thing that's been compelling is the rate of change. Like it was just like, wham, like, and it, it's, it's not that maybe it wasn't expected because we all saw like in 2021, all of the stimulus, all of the money that's coming. But then, as you said, like I was looking at Canada bond rates and I think they're up 2.5 or something like that, like from January to June, like from one point something to 3.5. And it's like the rate of change over a six month period has never been seen, like how fast those interest rates have, have gone up. Yeah, bonds. So aggregate bonds, again, I'm going to use aggregate because that's what most people would own in like a 401k or if they're going to have some sort of robo portfolio or anything else. That's a negative total return since 2020, right? Like that is a negative, that, that is lost money. And what I've seen a lot, and again, I do spend some time on Twitter. I think Twitter can be great. It can also be a black hole where your attention goes to die, but there are a lot of peers and people that I respect that are just like, oh, well, just be patient. Like there's a reason you want to own bonds. And I'm just saying you're playing a game that no longer exists at the moment. So there was a Deutsche Bank chart that put out 10 year treasury bonds and they looked back and they used some proxies. So it went back to, I think, 1781 and 2022 is the worst start through April since 1788 for US treasury bonds. Worst start ever. And that to me is telling, like all of a sudden you're seeing a massive change. And there's people that are just refusing to believe that what's going on. And so they're, what they're betting on is that we are going to raise interest rates and we are going to go into a recession slash depression. And all of a sudden they're going to cut rates and I'm going to make money on that yeah. because that's been the playbook in uh, you know, the last 40 years. Basically, anytime there's been an issue, the government has come in and said, Hey, instead of addressing the issue, what we are going to do is provide and throw money at the problem and solve it. Well, that works when you have interest rates that start at 16% in 1981. And now we're starting a, a, a spot where it's much, much lower. So I, I struggle to see how that game continues to play. And Europe is already in that spot where they're really, really in a tricky, tricky scenario. It's a little different because of the, the way the euro structured versus the, the United States dollar. And we're just in a, in a spot where if that's the play and you think it's the exact same playbook, you might be right and you can make some good money. But the risk return there it, to me is not as beneficial as it's been in the past. And for most people, what may happen is we see inflation higher for the next five, six, seven years, and it is just a slow grind lower and you just continue to lose money. And if you continue to see that happen, people at some point are going to start rotating out of that because investors do not just sit in things that lose money for a long time. And now with bonds, they may sit in longer because they're going to have people telling them like, just wait, just wait, just wait. But I, I just, I don't think that people are going to be patient enough to see that. And I think they're going to end up selling at the wrong time. And so it's not too late. It's not like bonds have been the worst thing ever, but I think we're seeing an environment that is structurally changed and is different. And I know in investing that this time is different is like the most dangerous words, but it's really not different. It's just going through a different, um, we've seen these cycles before. It's just a changing of it. And these are always really challenging. And so, you know, going back, Jonathan, to our conversation, like you see these 
periods of time where all of a sudden there's these massive shifts. And for anyone that's not ever heard of or read, and I think I might've talked about it last time, the fourth turning. So every fourth generation, these massive shifts, we're kind of in one of those massive shifts. And there's usually great opportunities, but there's also people that are still using a, a playbook or a strategy that no longer is going to exist into the future. And it takes them a long time to adjust and adapt to that. So I think being adaptable and being able to say, you know what, I can own things more than just stocks and bonds. You probably do better. Which brings us to the conversation of Bitcoin. Yeah, I know. It just went straight down since we talked last time, right? It has. <laughs> and I'm not gloating on that whatsoever because guess what's gone down even further? Ethereum yeah. and the entire crypto market. You know, I'm looking at a graph here right now. It's gone from 3 million, uh, sorry, 3 trillion in market cap now down to a million. What are we at? Just under a million or under a trillion, excuse me. Uh, it has been unbelievable. What does that look like from your perspective? And does your thesis hold through to what we are discussing in terms of long-term wealth possible accumulation? Um, so my thesis is not change is Bitcoin and then everything else is VC investing, right? So, I mean, we talked about that before of kind of, sure there's going to be a lot of, there's a lot of zeros that are out there. And I think that's come to fruition. So you saw the number four largest crypto, which was a complete scam yeah. of the Luna UST. Yeah. Um, debacle. And so the idea of indexing or diversification in the world of crypto to me makes little to no sense. Um, it is akin to gambling. So Bitcoin to me is the one thing that truly is decentralized. And I think just what over the weekend, Solana was talking about how they were going to yeah. take the person with the, the largest balance to take over their funds so that they wouldn't uh, get liquidated. To me, that's not a free and open market. That is um, yeah. That is playing with the same games that is currently in the traditional financial sector. And so like the DeFi right. thing to me is bunk. Like there's, there's no DeFi, right? Again, we, we don't need to like rehash no. all of that, but what we've seen no, is- We sure don't, which, which is absolutely true. Like I, I'm, I'm on your side on that. So it is, so, it has played out in multiple yield, absolutely breaking apart over the past four months. What, what's happened is there's leverage in that system. People yep. thought, hey, low interest rates, um, there's not gonna be any pressures. There's not gonna be people that maybe are gonna wanna take self-custody of, of funds. And they played the same games that have happened in the past. And so if you go historically old time bank runs and people would go bust back when the government didn't just bail everyone out, that's basically what happened. So, so crypto and, and Bitcoin in general, like there's businesses that are built on top of them and they played games that they shouldn't have played and they got blown out, which they should. People should go bankrupt and people should lose funds if they're stupid with how they do things. And they were foolish with what they did. And then they started locking withdrawals. So you can look at Celsius, Three Arrows Capital, yeah was kind of this like VC hedge fund of two, you know, wonder kids. And they've basically went insolvent. You're seeing, I think it's called Babel. That's in uh, Southeast Asia that is locked withdrawals. Um, if anyone has funds on these kind of exchanges and they're trying to earn yield on something, I would ask them to please, please, please learn about self-custody and get it off of there and, and just get away from some of these services that are rehypothecating or basically taking, you know, Jonathan and Michael and Isaiah's money and then turning it into, you know, 20 more things that aren't really there. Cause that's the game of what kind of the fiat currency is where, you know, fiat is a credit-based system, right? So for every dollar that gets deposited, nine go out the door. And so it's, it's trying to do the same thing with something that's supposed to be different and it's just not a game that can be played. And so what's happened is there's been a lot of leverage in the space. Things have gotten cleansed. Think of a forest fire. And for Bitcoin, nothing's changed. You saw people that got over levered or borrowed money or did stupid things lose their money because they were punished. There's no circuit breakers in you know, Bitcoin or crypto. There's no one to stop the bleeding. Like it goes until there's you know, people that no longer want to do things. And I, I have to chuckle a little bit at traditional finance that dances on the grave of things because it's like, well, if the market's down 4%, CNBC's got a thing running about how there's a bloodbath in the market. And they're like, that's like a slow, like Tuesday afternoon, in like crypto. negative 4%. <laughs> Come on, man. Like you just, I get it that for a lot of people, you have to understand why you own it because it's so easy to get scared and just freak out. If you don't understand it, yeah, I would have been, you know, losing it, watching the price action. Yep. The, the narrative hasn't changed. There's still 21 million Bitcoin. They produce blocks every 10 minutes. No one can stop it. It's apolitical money. And you know that you're not going to get diluted for the amount of things that you own. So like, what, what is there to change other than say, hey, if I'm going to buy a portion of this and save into it, I still own the same piece of the pie. So do you feel that with some of these big uh, firms that are going down and firms is even maybe 
giving yeah. too much respect to them. Uh, where do you feel Bitcoin is going to go? And again, this is not financial advice. This is opinion on this podcast. Where do you feel it's going to go both in the short term and long term and define long term any way you wish? Oh, man. And I mean, in terms of price expectancy and resolution of whatever <laughs> this looks like right now. Huge yeah. question. <laughs> I feel like if, I have to preface Isaiah this. If Isaiah fails yeah. this, then we're, we're putting him under retainer. Yeah. He can only come on our podcast. And he's our, he's our, yeah. So he is so, our nuanced Maggi in every future. So for anyone that wants to know my prediction skills, I can go back and listen to an episode that I did on my podcast where I predicted things at the beginning of the year. I said, Bitcoin would go to $200,000 by the end of the year. Okay. So how's that looking right now? looks pretty shitty. <laughs> Um, what do I, what along I think with, short- along with thousands of others yeah, that yeah. said the same, no, no, no. But it, again, like the crystal ball is broken. So I, I look at it as, you know, Bitcoin is going to, to recover and what happened in 2020. So you saw basically the, the auction get sucked out of the room. Everything goes down together. Correlations go to one. So every asset gets, gets crushed and then, Hey, money printer go burr. Right. And so all this stuff gets created and Bitcoin recovers. I don't know if that happens this time, right? Like that's the tricky part, but Bitcoin bottomed before the traditional market. So like the NASDAQ, the S&P, all those different things. And what you saw over the weekend was they were trying to get 20,000, uh, you know, this, this level protected and it broke through yeah. that. And then it was like, well, okay, who, who knows what's going to happen now? And it went down as low, I think it was like 17,800, uh, 17.5, something like that. And it's, it's bounced back. It's a little over 20,000 as we're speaking right now. To me, that is incredibly cheap. Bitcoin is going to go to seven figures before the end of this decade. That's what I will tell you from a price perspective. So if I think it's going to go to over a million dollars per Bitcoin, and now you have to qualify, like, what's a million dollars buy me in that? Maybe it buys me, you know, the mailbox out in front of my house. Like, it's funny money, right? Um, But if I think it goes there, and let's say it's a million dollars in today's dollars, does it matter if I bought it at 20, if I bought it at 40, if I bought it at 60? If Bitcoin was at $100,000 right now, I would say the exact same thing. I wouldn't want to take a victory lap because it is a volatile asset, but in a, in a world where money is free to create and there is a money that is not free to create, where it actually takes an input, which is energy to make it And that energy right now, there's estimations of, Hey, maybe that for a lot of people is like 12 to $14,000. Maybe that's closer to the bottom, but you know, there's a publicly traded company called Marathon Digital Holdings, and it costs them $6,500 for them to input the electricity to make a Bitcoin. Now they have CapEx and they have other things. But you know it's fairly inexpensive for them to still be profitable in this environment, and so, you know, I, I don't know short term. Do I think Bitcoin will, can recover and set an all-time high this year? Absolutely. Like anything is possible. Bitcoin can move very quickly, and there can be squeezes up, just like there's squeezes down. And that, to me, is like an impossible task. Even trying to do 12 months, where I, I, I don't know, maybe it still hits 200k, but I'm not holding my breath, and I'll take the L on that. Um, but I think the reason you want to own it has been unchanged. And for people that I've talked to and advocated for them to own it, it's been a hard time for them where it's like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is horrible. And I'm like, I understand because, you know, anytime that someone has an investment loss, they feel it twice as much as a gain. Like that is true. Like it makes you sick to your stomach if you aren't confident in, in the why, where I know that I have more confidence than a lot of people that I've tried to explain the why behind Bitcoin. And I get that there's some trust there for them to understand it. They still own the exact amount of Bitcoin. They weren't leveraged. They didn't get wiped out. Yep. The, the US dollar price next to it, that to me is not the important thing. And I know that seems really stupid, but it's like, what are you going to do? Sell it back for dollars? Didn't we talk about why you don't want dollars in the first place? So like, I think Bitcoin becomes a unit of account. I still think it becomes a global reserve currency at some point in my life. So like, that's what I want to own it for. This is not something that I'm going to own for a short period of time. Like you save into it, save into so right it. right now you say... Buy Bitcoin, not buy gold. If you're looking at a hit, hedge against inflation, if you want a buggy, buy gold. If you want a race car, buy Bitcoin. I think that's like basically what. Um, oh, who? Someone way smarter than me that is um, out there said that. So that's not an original Isaiah. Why? Well, I, I can't think of his name all of a sudden. But uh, maybe Druckenmiller, Stanley Druckenmiller. I think Druckenmiller. Was the I was thinking said. Sailor, maybe for Memphis, yeah, but... yeah, maybe not Sailor. <laughs> at least I. <laughs> hey, and I still think there's a lot of people that hate on Michael Sailor, who is the CEO of mm-hmm. MicroStrategies, that that basically has bought an absolute ton of Bitcoin and borrowed money to do so. So his idea is what's called like a speculative attack against uh, the dollar, and that was written about in 2014 by Pierre Richard. And you know, the idea is that you take bad money and you buy good money there's always the risk that you get too overextended and you hit a point where a recession and because microstrategy is a technology company that makes, I think it was $50 million a year in profit. 
like, yeah, all, all of a sudden they lose customers. There is some risk there. So I think that's the part where, you know, there, there's a, a Bitcoin, I hate the word influencer, but he's just a good guy that kind of educates named Matt Odell. He talks about, yeah, just stack stats and stay humble. I think it's one of those things that if you don't stay humble, you're going to get wrecked because it is so volatile. So if you're going to do things on margin or borrow money and, and try to overextend to get a little bit extra, you'll probably end up with less. So if you can just be consistent, a little bit is going to go such a long way. You don't have to own a whole Bitcoin, right? You could buy $5 worth every week or every month. And that's still going to be significant wealth into the future. If, if I am correct, if other people are correct, one of the interesting things is every cycle. So every four-year cycle, more people come into Bitcoin and you see the, the addresses and the amount of Bitcoin that's held and these different things, it's growing. And so Jurian Timmer of Fidelity, you should follow him on Twitter. He has awesome charts. He looks at the adoption curve of a lot of different technologies, whether it's the phone, railroads, cars, telephones, internet, Bitcoin is tracking right along with that. And so if you think human nature stays unchanged and you can show people that there's actually better money that they can save into, especially for the everyday common working person that instead of living paycheck to paycheck, maybe they can put a little bit of money in something and it, it can actually grow. Um, they'll start to adopt that. And over time, the incentives will win and it will drive out the bad money. Now, this is something that's not a six month, 12 month, 18 month thing. Like this is going to take some time and being early sometimes is painful. And I think that's the biggest thing. Man, okay. I have so many tangents on this. So obviously pro bit Bitcoin diving more into veterinarians listening. How can they be resilient? Cause that was kind of our early messaging here is through this time inflation going up. We don't know how long it's here for. Do the money printers turn back on or don't they? We don't know. Interest rates are rising. So what other tactics would you say to people? You know, watch your leverage, like AKA don't have leverage would be ideal. Yes. What other things can, can they be doing now or starting to position themselves for their family, their portfolio to be resilient through an uncertain next couple of years? I'm going to answer this in a way that probably is not what you think, but if I'm going to be resilient, I think one of the things that's been talked about and I've been called a, you know, a tinfoil hat doomsday person for this is the food security piece. And I think if people can be a little bit more um, self-sovereign from a food perspective, whether it is growing stuff, which, you know, maybe that's a little late to get started into that, but there's farmer's markets, there's places around you locally to, to source your food. And I would encourage people, Hey, if you have a deep freeze, a, if you don't have one, get one right? Stock up. If you eat animal protein, go shake, you know, your local farmer's hand and buy a quarter cow or a half hog or something, you know, find ways where you can consume locally. And Hey, you, that might cost more than going down to the, the local grocery store. But when that stuff's out, which it may be, and there's some people that again, are much more tied into this than I, that are predicting things that are scary and are not fun to think about. And I get that. Worst case scenario is if you stock up and you have items, you eat through it and you know what? You go buy more. That's the worst case. And so for me, if I'm trying to be resilient, as long as I have enough food on the table for me and my family, I think that is the easiest thing, regardless of you know, the investment standpoint. From the investment standpoint, it is you can only control your savings rate and you can control the risks that you're taking. And so if I think about, again, the kind of the four different environments I can be in, inflation up, inflation down, growth, no growth in the economy, have something that can do well in all of those, or try to have some semblance of balance versus trying to pick, Hey, this is where I think I am. And I'm going to go all in or all out. It's not necessarily a light switch. You can be a little bit of a dimmer. And I just don't think you're going to be compensated at the moment for taking a ton of risks. And again, I know I just talked about Bitcoin. Um, to me, that is there, there's different risks there and it's solving for a different thing, but in general, like you don't need to be, Hey, I'm hundred percent in stocks or I'm hundred percent in bonds or I'm hundred percent in gold or I'm hundred percent in Bitcoin. So it can be a combination of these things. And if you think inflation stays around and I, I do think it stays around longer because it is going to be a little bit painful, um, you know, energies, commodities, that's, that's a place to, to maybe look at adding, because if you look at the S and P 500 energy is about less than seven or 8%. So it's very underrepresented and it's done really well. We still need to get to work and energy is on the rise. And I think there's, there's opportunity there. So, yeah. Some of the people I follow when we talk about like inflation, interest rates and invasion is what they're throwing in as like another eye that is really setting the scene for the next few years. Cause the food shortage that you're referring to, we're really not going to experience it until about fall when, when the 2020 crop year or sorry, 2022 crop year or lack of crop 
starts, you know, filtering through to people's tables. And it's, it doesn't matter what your net worth is. If you're looking for food, you know, like none of that matters anymore. So. Totally. Um, one other last thing that we kind of talked about just before, um, we hit record, which I think was the inflation in the Bitcoin piece. I just want to go back and revert to that because Jonathan was fucking me. So if you go back to the beginning of 2020 um, and you look at M2, which is the money supply, and you look at what asset has done best since 2020, um, even Bitcoin with the drawdown is still up, I think north of 50 and the S&P is up 19, bonds are negative and gold is just slightly above flat. So my question is what and how are you measuring inflation? If it's CPI and you're looking at it month over month, or are we looking at kind of front running that and it's tied to the money piece, like the monetary units created. That's the way that I look at inflation and the way that I've heard it described. And again, a lot of what I um, talk about is just taking bits and pieces from other places and then trying to to tie and and weave those together. But I think there is some truth to that where over time and not necessarily in a shorter timeframe as far as like CPI, but that would be the way that I would answer that because I can hear people, you know, Jonathan, you talked about it saying, okay, Isaiah, it's great that you think this, but if higher inflation and Bitcoin stunk during this time frame, like why would you still advocate to own it? And, and to me, that is why, because if we see the same kind of idea, like it is the offset to additional monetary units being created. And up to this point, they've never stopped continuing to create, even if they talk about quantitative tightening and these other things, they, they, that has never stopped, right? The, the, the inflation in the, the monetary units across the globe has continued to expand. And to me, that's an offset to it. And that is like, if you want to really distill and boil it down, it's take the value you created today and store it in something that isn't going to be inflated away. Because the idea of inflation is it's just going into your bank account, taking the money that you worked really hard for and saying, I don't value that. And that should piss people off. It is when you drill down into that and you think of, of storing it in what, whatever sort of currency, if you think of it as your energy, like your blood, sweat, and tears in the veterinary clinic pouring away and you store that in your bank account and then someone else, a group of people elsewhere say, hey, surprise, here's trillions more. You had to work really hard for that, but we don't. And here it is to, to people we choose. It's like, there goes all your stored energy you know, is another way of, of kind of looking at that. And yep, I love that, that, uh, framing of it. So. Oh, so much trouble. I could get into with that comment further. <laughs> I know I, I feel bad because you need the rebuttal. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, Isaiah, thanks for coming on. We wanted to keep this tight. We wanted to just sort of dive in because it, I don't know if you are noticing it in the States as much for me, it was about two weeks ago. I really noticed the media headlines like turned and got very like very dramatic. Like it was like one in four people will not be able to afford mm. their mortgage and all of this stuff. And it's it's hard to know, you know, what is the reality? What's what's good information out there? So, you know, we just wanted to kind of dive in. Um, I do want to give you the the last chance to kind of wrap things here. We talked about resiliency, but I guess closing message for for the veterinarians or, or anyone that is listening here on navigating, you know, the rest of 2022 as it sets up. And, and, and beyond. I would just say from an income perspective, if you are at a place that you don't feel respected and that they're paying you well, there are plenty of people out there that are begging for good, you know, doctors and, and team members. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask and speak up. If you are on salary and you want to go in and have a conversation, say, Hey, can I switch over to production? And you would be making more. Uh, I think you should do that. I think you should feel comfortable being able to go ask and push a little bit in spots to ensure that you can kind of keep pace because right or wrong, if we do see this inflationary environment run, uh, I think you can protect yourself and your family a little bit better with your income alongside that if you're on a production or pro sale basis. And for everyone else, again, I go back to your spot on Michael with the food perspective. We're not going to know for sure till later this year, but to me, that's one that I've tried to talk to as many people that will listen. And I know it's a little bit of outside of kind of my realm of expertise, but it's like, Hey, if you can be a little bit more self-sufficient, I think you'll be happy and worst cases you just have extra on hand thank you for listening to the veterinary project podcast as a recap on behalf of our hosts the veterinary project podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly so be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived if you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know please like love and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing as we're available on all the usual suspects 
If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.